and now a reading from Memoirs by David Rockefeller. Actually, I can't read from it yet because I just behold his greatness. Look at that. He's like, I will not even look directly into the camera. I am too good for that. I will only let you profile me. Behold my tie. It is worth more than your children. I am glorious. Ugh. Okay. I, I came across this quote, and I know I'm late to the game, as usual, but I it's still sinking in for me, as I'm sure it did for many of you when you read it. Okay. This is from a section called Proud Internationalist, under the heading Populist Paranoia. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as, quote, internationalists, and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. And he's saying that as if it's a joke, or as if these people are crazy for thinking that, even though... Quite obviously, that's entirely what's going on for multiple reasons. Actually, this is a quote from a book called Hell of a Town, The Story of New York City During World War II. Let's just read this for a second. This has to do with the $8.5 million that the Rockefeller family paid for the land that would become the United Nations headquarters. And it says the deal was completed on December 11th, 1946, reportedly at Zeckendorf's unofficial offices in the Monte Carlo nightclub. Zeckendorf was the guy who owned the land. When the architect Wallace Harrison, the planning director for the UN building, signed the final papers, he telephoned Nelson Rockefeller at his Rockefeller Center office with the news, and Rockefeller shouted into the phone, Wally, that calls for a celebration. See if you can't bring back a bottle of champagne. Harrison went to a liquor store for something worthy of the occasion, and in his wallet, he had the executed papers for the $8.5 million deal and two $1 bills for the champagne. So they bought the land the United Nations headquarters ended up being founded on. And then you've got this book here. This is the Rockefeller Panel Reports. And this was published, I think, in 59. This copy was 61. But there's all kinds of stuff about how the United Nations is our best hope for world peace. It's the best thing we've got. I'm just going to read a couple because the sections go on and on and on. But here's one. And this is actually in, in a section called the growth of community that has to do with the uh, America's economy. And so before I read this, actually, let's go back to his quote again real quick. He says, some believe we're part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States. And he's talking about how they want to build more integrated political, global political and economic structure. And then you've got these Rockefeller panel reports where they straight up say that the United Nations plays a vitally important role in the development of a functioning international system. The United Nations that they helped build. And then this whole thing talks about that. And over here it says, The UN stands finally as a symbol of the world order that will one day be built. So that was the whole plan for the United Nations, as a world order. And actually later in this book, they actually call it a new world order. I believe that's on page 72. And it says, America's own interest in the role it is called upon to play in all parts of the world require it to work toward the removal of race and color significant factors. Quote, in a new world order. And going back to his beautiful visage, no, I'm sorry, going back to his memoirs, just such a stunning, beautiful man. You're missing out. Look. Yes, I am posed from the side. I just can't get over that. It's such a smarmy picture. Okay, anyway, do you, you like that? I'm not cynical. I've just been taking notes. History book. Anyway. <clears throat> Um, it's pretty accurate. Let's see if I can get back to the page I was on. I think it was 407. If you go back to this chapter, proud internationalist here, 
So he says this. He says, well, if that's a charge, I'm guilty, right? But then you go through and look at some of the other headers in this chapter. You've got the Council on Foreign Relations. You've got Bilderberg. Oh, this is really good. Underneath Bilderberg, it says, if the Council on Foreign Relations raises the hackles of conspiracy theorists, the Bilderberg meetings must induce apocalyptic visions of omnipotent international bankers plotting with unscrupulous government officials to impose cunning schemes on an ignorant and unsuspecting world. He says it like it's supposed to be a joke. That's actually what's going on. Anyway, you've got uh, consorting with reactionaries. Uh, where he's talking about how he was in other groups, not just the Bilderberg group, furthering international cooperation. Well, they're all about that. Oh, there's Kissinger's name. He's in everything. Fighting protectionism. Let's see what else. The Trilateral Commission. So that's good. Hold on. He founded that group, by the way. Go ahead. Didn't they found a lot, I mean, not Bilderberg, but didn't they found the Council on Foreign Relations, too? Pretty much, yeah. Weren't they behind the League of Nations, too? They're deeply involved in this whole 20th century deal. Like everything. What else? Do we have anything else in here? Cons yeah, I mean, if you just want to wonder if they're really involved in, quote, conspiracies on the international level, all you have to do is go to the admission after the smarmy paragraph you pointed out about Bilderberg about how it gives people apocalyptic visions to read about. Well, is Bilderberg involved in insider trading? Are they involved in scheming? Do they plan things at their meetings? In 1976, Bilderberg faced a scandal that almost resulted in its collapse. In that year, in testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it was alleged that Prince Bernhard, that's the, print, uh, that's the founder of Bilderberg and the Prince of the Netherlands, Prince Bernhard had approached the Lockheed Corporation with an offer to use his position to influence the Dutch defense procurement policies in return for significant financial consideration. As the year wore on, the evidence against Bernhard accumulated, including indications he had met with intermediaries during Bilderberg events. The 1976 conference was canceled, and it appeared for a time that Bilderberg was finished. But Bilderberg's not involved in plotting anything they're just there doing stuff. And here they are talking about the reactionaries and some Italian groups. But on the next page, where they talk about trade barriers and protectionism, they're talking about their role in GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. They're also involved in the World Trade Organization, NAFTA, you name it. Pretty much oh, yeah. all well, these different agreements. After He makes this joke in this book. It's most of the way through the book, as you can see. But there's another chapter earlier on called Creating a Global Bank. Wow. So he's sitting here making jokes about how he's not in on some, their, their family isn't in on some big uh, charge for an integrated global political and economic structure, one world if you will. The earlier chapter is called Creating a Global Bank. Yeah, and there's another part in this book, I wasn't prepared to flip to it, but during his Chase Manhattan days, he bragged about knowing every single leader, every last one in Latin America, which is South America, Central America, all the leaders of all those countries, which, by the way, all underwent coups and revolutions at the hand of the CIA, and you name it. These guys have their uh, thumbs in the pie of everything going on in the 20th century on a global scale, and they're arrogantly bragging about it in the memoirs. He's just, he's got his glass, and he's like, Yes, hmm, I'm plotting, yeah. He's got that horrible look, too. Don't look at my face. Only look at me from the side. You will only see 50% of my beautiful man visage. Ugh. 97 years old. I kind of think I threw up in my mouth a little. Yeah, I might want to brush my teeth.